thanks everybody for being here on a much nicer day than it was last weekend. So we, uh, last week, if you were not here, we covered this, kind of like history, history guy, now we're back in time, see it's last week, the date's up there. This is the first uh, picture we gave, which was an overview of this region and its settlement history and this evolution of Underground Railroad through the social movements of uh, anti-slavery activity. And so today, we gave that overview, but I'll recap it a little bit, but today we're talking about the, um, if the machine does what it's supposed to, there we go. It, we're talking about St. James and other faith communities in the city and in the community at large, what, what the reactions were, as much as we can glean, because frankly, there's not all that much information out there. It's very difficult to put a lot of this in context because so little of this was actually written down back in the day. We have this amazing uh, history that we deal with called the Underground Railroad, and it appears to emerge in the aftermath of the American Revolution and extends into the time of emancipation and the Civil War period. That seems to be the beginning and end book of this whole time period that we're dealing with here. We, uh, we are at, I guess, at the grace of uh, William Penn and the uh, religious tolerance that, that this colony was known for that brought so many people here, which is part of why this area had such a... Uh, uh, what would you say, an aggressive activity to stop slavery eventually, with pockets of uh, this energy that came out of the, the faith community. Um, we also have your standard technical difficulty in such that um, we have things like, hang on one second, please. Uh, bear with me. Um, what I need to do is see uh, see what I'm telling you about on the screen, and that's not happening, of course. <coughs> Hang on, there's supposed to be great with you. Do we have anybody under 20? This is bizarre. Normally it's the first thing. There we go. We have a professor of many 20 year olds. I'm not seeing what I'm supposed to see. Oh, there we go. Guy. Two history guys, positive and negative, come together. The idea of William Penn was that attraction of all faiths that we were able to set up here, unlike all the other provinces of the, of the colonies that were more focused on a particular religious denomination, or, or not. But the faith community seemed to be a big part of it. The notion of families being broken up, like we're dealing with this, these kinds of issues with migration today, as political asylum seekers, um, People moving because of famines and wars. Families breaking up is what seems to have tripped these people back then that they had to get out of the horrible system of slavery that they were laboring under for generations. So while we had a lot of religious tolerance here, religious underpinnings here, we still had the fourth largest population of enslaved people in all of the counties at that particular time period. When that magical date, I'll tell you about in a second, keep that date in mind, of 1780. So after that, we still had this kind of activity going on. The, the stale of a, the time of a, an indentured servant. In those years, after 1780, if you were African American and an enslaved situation, you had to serve in that, that, in that situation until you were age 27 under this thing called the Gradual Abolition Act of Pennsylvania. Um, and what people could do is buy, on the, like on the open market, if you could believe that, buy the, the indentured servitude time of a person who's still under that umbrella of that onerous law, and it would add, put ads in the paper like this. The Gradual Abolition Act, as I said, Pennsylvania was in the forefront, like its religious tolerance layer, was in the forefront on the political side of gradually abolishing slavery. And that was in, due in no small part to the Quaker influence coming out of Philadelphia, the legislature, Ben Franklin, setting up the uh, first anti-slavery society in the country. and. This all folded together to create Pennsylvania and these border counties along the south part of Pennsylvania, Maryland, up against those in, uh, states where enslavement occurred as this hotbed of activity all along this region. And when most people came north out of uh, the south from Maryland, 
from the big plantations of Northern Virginia into this free state of Pennsylvania, they headed east because there was no way to get north and there was nothing up there in the aftermath of the revolution. So Philadelphia was the large place that people wanted to get to. From there, you could get to New England, Canada, and, and ultimate freedom. But Pennsylvania, I'm sorry, Philadelphia had a large population of freed Africans um, that worked together with white people to help these newcomers come along. And uh, that was the mix that, that happened. And there were these little miniature examples of the kind of social, economic uh, systems in along these border counties, of which Lancaster, York, uh, uh, Gettysburg, Chester County, they were all the same types of co concentrations of people politically, socially, economically aligned, religiously inspired. So this massive disobedience after the Civil War against prevailing law, the Constitution did not outlaw slavery. There were absolute uh, laws in place to, to, for people to be commanded to endorse slavery, to, to accept it in your, in your community. But this religious uh, underpinnings uh, created this racially integrated and religiously inspired civil rights movement. Um, as as uh, told by uh, author Fergus Bordovich in that book that I cited, Bound for Canaan. Recently, I had a, a presentation by Reverend Edward Bailey at Bethel AME Church down the street, uh, which, as you know, was an outgrowth of this church and other, uh, the other uh, mainline white denominated churches in the community. Reverend Bailey said this um, that for good and for worse, where we are today with race relations, with these issues we're talking about that are coming forward, is because of the church. It's in and around the umbrella and the the activity of the church. So that's what we're going to focus on today. Attitudes of individuals, involvement of institutions. Um, it was spotty and it, it, it grew up out of different roots and different strains of Christianity and we'll see what we talk about here at St. James in this particular perspective. Pretty, pretty darn interesting. As we're looking back on our 275th anniversary and seeing where we've come from, where we are, and where we're going to. This I found to be very, this is the first school teacher here at St. James. And it gives you that sense of his being a, um, a minister of the gospel. He's, a, he's a, a, a minister in that regard, a missionary, teaching uh, African Americans here in this early stage of this uh, faith community, but looking at them as poor creatures that hopefully they will be much benefited. And that's the kind of narrative you see in such a, of, of, a, uh, of a look back at that particular time frame. These downtrodden people were kind of helping, helping them come along and of course, they did, did need that. But there was also emerging uh, a stronger, uh, independent, I guess you could say, faith community emerging here. This is an amazing example of the disparity, the lack of understanding of basic humanity between white people and black people in this time period. Now, in 1762, when Edward Shippen was um, a pretty high roller here in St. James and in the larger community, um, there had been hundreds of years of slavery as an institution, as a commonly accepted practice day to day in this community and in, in this country and in the world. So Shippen, who lived right up the street uh, at the site of the YMCA um, on that corner, and this is the grand house that was torn down in 1916 to put the building up there that's up there today. So at Lime and Orange. So this wonderful work from great uh, scholars at Millersville University and uh, Dr. Marianne Arnold, Marlene Arnold, I'm sorry, they, they're creating a, a thing called Providence Project. It's, I, I don't know what, what stage they're in right now, but they're exhuming amazing history of this area. Shippen, who was the uh, in the military, the revolution, he was the head of the Committee of Correspondence, buried out in our churchyard. He was, he's the grand, uh, grandfather of Peggy Shippen, who married Benedict Arnold, side story. But um, he, um, this Committee of Correspondence was like the intelligence gathering operation for the colonial army. So a very learned guy. So he has an enslaved woman, or an indentured servant black woman, living in his home. He writes a letter to Reverend Craig, who's an Episcopalian minister in the northern part of the county, and he says he saw her kissing a black man in the back of his backyard of his house, didn't know who the guy was, and asked her about it, and she said, it's my husband. I don't see him that often because he's enslaved by, he's a slave of Mr. So-and-so from Philadelphia, and I only see him occasionally. So he writes to, to, to his buddy, Reverend Craig, and says, I now understand they have affections just like we do. So again, common accepted activity. We all know about Mr. Robert Coleman, this very autocratic, top-down deliverer of, uh, of, I wouldn't say he was a liberal contributor, he was a, a benevolent contributor in terms of finances, but he wouldn't say he was liberal in terms of his activity, because he, like he was an officer, 
General Assembly rep, uh, constitutional uh, uh, convener, signer, and a uh, judge. But he had slaves, Mark, the Marty Forge uh, down in, in Marty Township and the Coleman Estates. They had a burn down, a cut down and burned down you know, all the virgin timber around here, and they needed labor. Some of it was paid, some of it was enslaved. But obviously, Mr. Coleman derived a lot of wealth from the natural environment and the, the slave labor that was available in the community. So we know no ministers who were uh, owners of slaves, but there was not a big Episcopalian outreach. I didn't really move that. Uh, against, uh, for or against slavery at that time. It was kind of a silence. It was set, found to be a, uh, a secular issue, not a religious one. That's, of course, that's what I'm reading by virtue of reading other people's accounts of this situation. I passed around a 10-page paper that Dr. Leroy Hopkins put together years ago. He extracted uh, from our archives that are now online, if you want to look at, up this material yourself. Uh, you, I think it's on, is that on the website, anybody know? I believe it is. It's remarkable source material. Um, but Leroy Hopkins is a scholar, a German uh, professor, but he's an African-American scholar. We're working with him on the African-American Historical Society. What he found and told me from looking at St. James records was he saw a transition in that enslaved people and were indentured servants living under, uh, who were members of the church. Um, when, it, when he saw in the records that it went from individuals having just given names, adopting surnames over the years, building families and around a, a, a surname, that was an indication that people were uh, being either self-liberated or were, be, or were so-called manumitting or being given their liberty or buying their liberty. And in, in our faith community, there seemed to be a transition in the late 18th century, early 19th century, where when you see the names in the register like this, independent, they're not sponsored by somebody to get married, which is what, which are some of the early uh, uh, ways that you, if you wanted to get married, some a white owner or white head of household had to sponsor you before the church. But look at the records and the names of that thing I passed around. It's phenomenal. It's, it's remarkable how they describe people in this situation. So this gives the point that all of the churches in the downtown area accepted African Americans as members. But the issue was, um, did we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal in the aftermath of the revolution? and leading up to an early American culture and society in this activity. Well, that's the question. How, how, what was that transition? How did it happen? And how we're still perfecting this union? So last week I told you about to look at, consider some things about flashpoints in history that set in motion wars, social movements, political activities <laughs> always seem to start with some flashpoint that maybe is intended, maybe is not. Most of the time it's unintended, like an assassination of the Archduke of World War I in Sarajevo, 1815. Martin Luther is credited with creating this protest against the Catholic Church by the nailing of the 95 Theses on the cathedral wall, the door, um, civil war. But what happens is a historian or a journalist, sometimes after these flashpoint occurrences, give that movement or that war a name, right? So World War I was called that, was called the Great War first until World War II came. And they changed the, the lex, lexicon for that. Um, about this, bombing of Pearl Harbor, um, Kent State shootings, that classic picture of the lady uh, seeing the people shot, and then most recently, Arab Spring. Again, I'm not sure who came up with that name, Arab Spring, but this is, I'm thinking, this is the same thing that happened to this very semi-mysterious thing called the Underground Railroad. We, we still don't know who created that name, who first coined it. It had to be in print by somebody somewhere. It had to be part of the language to describe the secret system of moving people from one place to another out of slavery and into freedom by these black and white people working together to move people along a system of safe houses, which is the classic definition. So flashpoints. Another flashpoint. July of 1755, Colonel Lieutenant George Washington was on his way to my home, hometown of Pittsburgh, and right outside of there where, where the uh, Braddock Steel Plant is today, uh, Braddock got defeated <coughs> by the uh, French and the Indians. So this was the English incursion to try to secure the frontier at that particular time. So why is this particular date important? Well, it's a flashpoint on the Western frontier that um, was the extent of the English empire at that time, and the, and the Western civilization consciousness, if you will. So recently, Martha and I uh, went down and visited Judd and Azetta's place in Rehoboth. Now, how do we get from George Washington and Pittsburgh to Rehoboth, little Atlantic colonies of, of uh, the eastern seaboard? So we're, we're there in Rehoboth, and I just wondered, what is directly across, if you, if you took a beeline east, right across the ocean, where would you end up going? 
Well, you go to Lisbon, Portugal. Mm -hmm. And so on another pilgrimage from St. James, lo these many years ago, we had this crew, this motley crew, took off for Spain and Portugal on a pilgrimage, which was wonderful. And Tom Purdy, upper left there, is, was our religious leader, and we had a, just an amazing time. Went across the, went across the ocean and so, went early on to Lisbon, which I don't think any of us have ever been there before. We had a great guide, and we found out about this beautiful European city, but we also went to, uh, on 264 years ago, almost today, we found out about the Lisbon earthquake. Never knew anything about this thing. And I don't think Tom did either, but we, we were just blown away when we realized people telling us in the historic sites about what effect that had on that city and that region. Look at the size of that impact there. This was a almost nine point on Richter scale blast. Wow. Tens of thousands of people killed. Tsunami came in after the earthquake. Fires, it was like hell on earth. And here's some of the depictions that they, that they that came out in the artwork, the aftermath, the description of this. And what the three takeaways from uh, uh, Professor Aguirre here, here is that it, was, it, trans it helped remake the, uh, this Portugal into a modern state. Uh, seismology came out of this. They first started understanding what the heck earthquakes are all about, and they started trying to figure it out. And, but the, here's the point. European understanding of nature during the Enlightenment. So really interesting, really interesting parallels here into this thought process, I think. Um, that kind of disruption happened on All Saints Day while hundreds of people were in this church and the roof collapsed and killed everybody in that church in the, in the fire. So we found out, that, uh, Tom Purdy and I found out in the, in the course of talking to guys there about this particular reverend who wrote up a graphic depiction of this entire uh, saga and spread it around Europe and it then evolved, it got into the popular press and it got into the hands of people like Voltaire. When you hear the name Voltaire, what do you think of? It's of enlightenment, Western civilization. This also spawned this movement, this philosophical, religious, intellectual movement called deism that set in motion something that is counter to what seemed to be the prevailing attitude. That if you are poor, God is looking badly on you in life today. If you have a deformity, if your skin color is black, you are a lesser person. This mode of thinking said, why would God, an all-powerful being, allow this natural occurrence to happen and kill these people in this Catholic religious community on All, all Saints Day. So people started, light bulbs apparently started going off, and that thought process, that intellectual movement, was imported into the early colonies, and guess who started picking up on all of these ideas? That maybe, maybe the system of relationship between God and man isn't what we've been told by the church, that God isn't involved in every little bit of act, actions of our daily lives, and it's a bigger, bigger, bigger picture. So that, to me, is what may have planted a seed for people to start questioning this institution of slavery. If people, if God isn't saying, I'm looking badly upon you and creating you and your lot in life right now, then maybe, maybe there's something else afoot here. Maybe we all start to better, better get along together with each other as an equal, rather than this retribution of God concept that we've, we've had. So we have a guy who I'm going to tell you about in the next 10 minutes, maybe 15 minutes, who I think had a, may have had a life transformation sitting in the pews of St. James in the, in the 17, late 1700s. And he has a direct connection, according to my research and to the National Park Service itself, our, our nation's uh, keepers of the historic history flame, that what he did was involved in a spontaneous uprising against slavery in Columbia, Lancaster County, in 1804, and uh, may have sparked what became known in 30-some years later as the Underground Railroad. So who was this guy in this weird kind of picture of this little sketchy face? We have, that's the only picture that anybody knows of him. But uh, he was a very prominent guy. And I don't know why there's not a better painting of him, but there were of his parents, as you'll see. He had, I mean, an amazing pedigree, I guess you could say. Uh, his brother, he fought at the Battle of Brandywine, which unfortunately I just found out, September 11th, 1777, that fateful day. His older brother, Samuel, was killed. He, he, um, his parents lived next door. They were on the, his dad was on the vestry. His dad was the fifth Burgess, or mayor of Lancaster. So Bow himself, I'm sorry I needed to pronounce the gentleman's name, Thomas Bow, member of the State House of Representatives eventually, as he moved from here, Lancaster City, to Columbia, and moved out. And according to the National Park Service, up until uh, 2010 or 11 or so, they had this on their chronology at, the, at their nation, our nation's uh, Civil Rights Museum in Topeka, Kansas. 
where the uh, monumental decision Brown versus Board of Education emanated. This elementary school where the segregation was, was accepted routinely in that elementary school system and where ACLU lawyer Thurgood Marshall challenged that and based it on the 14th Amendment, which, by the way, was my friend Patty Stevens' greatest achievement is, is the establishment of the 14th Amendment, equal protection under the law. Thurgood Marshall, the later Supreme Court Justice, found his legs in, in law and moved that and it ended, basically ended school desegregation or brought about the movement toward that. But it all goes back in, in that same place in Topeka, Kansas, that's just what they say. So here we are back in old St. James, back in when we had a stone building on the, on the site of the current building. This is the campus, you all know the orientation, pretty much, right? Orange Street, Duke Street, the size of the church. Now that's somewhere, somewhere in that interior area right there, probably anywhere, this, the old stone church was probably that size and that, that makeup of the, of the campus area. We're not exactly sure. Chip and I have been down in the basement checking things out and it's really a maze down there. And we don't know if any of this was built. This is an early rec uh, uh, rendering of what the church may have looked like. Started in 45 and completed, demolished to make way for the current church around 1819, 1820. So this is the sound, the seat seating plan that we have posted in our history book and it's in the poster that we have over in the vestibule of the church. And as you can see, Thomas Bowd is, live, is, is, is there with William Montgomery in that pew. Right behind him is this bench with servants and we're relegated to servants and Negroes. And that's how much we institutionalized this class system in our seating in our church. It didn't have, just happen here, it happened in all of the mainline churches in town. But interestingly, consider the fact that servants and Negroes. So my sense is that was white, white indentured servants. So it was more, it may have been more, as much of a class thing as, it much, as, as much as a racial thing. I'm hoping that that was the more positive side of this equation, but it was segregated seating. So what are congregants of St. James for, for centuries uh, to think? Now, I threw this in last minute without checking with Cordelia or Father David. <laughs> this is the epistle of St. James, and this is our guy, St. James, who's depicted in that stained glass window. And he wrote, what epistle did he, I believe? Um, but he talks about these kinds of issues, about equality, about people looking out for disadvantaged people. And you know, if, if you, how does your faith rest in, in your life if you're not actually taking action to help somebody rather than just saying, go in peace and, and, and good luck, basically. So he admonished the people he, who he was receiving, receiving his message in that regard. So how did the people of St. James, when they heard this epistle preached in the, in the pews of St. James in this time period, when did the light bulbs first going off about what kind of situation we're, we're, we're living and working under? So this guy was born uh, in 52, died in, at age 70, early 70s in, in Colombia. He left here, but I mean, this is his parents. His parents' por uh, portraits were painted by Benjamin West, the premier portrait painter of the, of the colonial era in and, and, and England as well. Um, Bethel, Mary Bethel Bode, Bowd, was um, from a prominent family in Colombia. That's how Major Bow, Thomas Bow, left here in the city and ended up in Colombia, we believe. Uh, they're in the portrait gallery of National Washington, D.C. I went to look at them, but they're not like displayed. They're in the archives somewhere, but you can pull them out if you want to. <coughs> so, flash forward to the 1960s. John Hope Franklin wrote one of the premier anti-racism, uh, anti pro, uh, uh, pro-civil rights books of that time period. And he writes about, he calls upon the uh, words of, of a writer in the 1940s to put in concept, in context, the slavery issue, the Underground Railroad issue, uh, written by Henrietta Buckmaster in uh, 1941. Her book is right here on page 23. Uh, this is what, uh, she's a Guggenheim fellow, by the way, and this is what she writes about this incident in our guy, Thomas Batman. This was the incorporation of the Underground Railroad. This flashpoint of his family resisting slavery to keep an indentured servant that he had in his household named Stephen Smith kept there because Stephen Smith's mother was illegally living with them in Colombia. She had escaped slavery, but Mrs. Smith's owner tried to come and drag her away. But the Bowd family resisted and said, no, Nancy Smith, mother of this young boy that's living with me, can stay within our family. We're driving away Mrs. Cochran, her name was. So drove this lady away, totally illegal. This was a guy who was a U.S. congressman, a state representative, a Revolutionary War vet, a successful businessman on the riverfront in Colombia. He put up, he stood up against slavery, which these authors in the mid in the mid 20th century said was the set in motion the sentiment that it was okay to oppose slavery. 
We only know one preacher in the city who spoke out from the pulpit against slavery in the 1850s. This is the 1850s. Uh, Reverend Crottle at Holy Trinity. There may have been others, but we only have his words admonishing his members that it's okay to oppose slavery. Well, that's what, what seemed to have happened. The sentiment in Colombia, because Colombia is such a, um, you can see over here all this activity, it is such a center point in all of the literature about the Underground Railroad. Colombia is the centerpiece of the community. So, as Buckmaster's narrative goes forward, and that John Hope Franklin writes, by the way, John Hope Franklin is memorialized in the ground, underground area of the National Museum, New Smithsonian Museum of African American History. It's a big contemplative space, twice as big as this room, with waterfalls hanging down, with incredible passages of words around the edge. And this guy was, is, is that much of a scholar, a much of a historian, historian. So I'm taking credence from what they have written to say that this interpretation of this flashpoint by Thomas Bow carried forward and set in motion what became a more systematized thing known as the Underground Railroad by the 1830s, somewhere in that time period. So, as you can see over here, um, Samuel Evans, the co-author of The History of Lancaster County, is one of the originators of this story. And these more recent authors picked up on that and rebranded it and put it into their works. So, to wrap up here, which I'll leave for this will be good, we'll have questions. Um, civil rights in America, right? Topeka, Kansas. Martha and Catherine and I had a chance to go out there. Happenstance, we just wanted to go see the historic site. This is where the Brown versus Board of Education uh, and all civil rights in America are depicted in exhibits and videos and displays. Um, and it's called The Road to Justice, Ending Segregation in Public Schools. And so we're, we're tracing through this uh, museum with your standard wall chronology thing. And um, on that wall, there's what it said. And I just was totally blown away. I said, what? Columbia? Who's this guy? And I, I don't think I even knew the name of the guy as being a member of St. James. But there it was. Well, then we have to ask the question, so who is this, what became of this little boy, Stephen Smith, who was at the center of this uprising and this uh, countenance of, this, uh, of not accommodating slavery, of rejecting slavery? Uh, so what happened was somehow Stephen Smith, this little African-American boy, became a teenager. He, he, bought, his, he bought his indentured servitude, or he was given it by Thomas Bowd, uh, and he, tur he turned over and got his lumber business. Bowd's lumber business turned it was given to him, conveyed to him, sold to him. We have no idea how it happened. But he becomes this incredible Underground Railroad activist in lumber. Uh, he was a, a businessman. He got into real estate and warehousing out there on the riverfront, becomes a minister, uh, and moved to Philadelphia and becomes a philanthropist. And uh, was wealthy enough. He and his partner, William Whipper, who was an amazing African-American businessman. These are two of the richest black business people in the nation before the years before the Civil War. And this guy's incredible himself, amazing writer. Uh, his writings are, are, are regarded as being some of the key inst instrumental, fun fundamental writings uh, that gave rise to the civil rights movement in the 1960s. So here we are back with uh, Samuel Evans. He's the guy that said, these two gentlemen and white Quaker abolitionist William Wright of the White Rice Ferry Mansion fame, the grandson of the original founder of Columbia, the three of them, there were so many people coming into Columbia and needed to get out of there because the place was covered with slave catchers who were, who were there to grab people and get the bounty and take people back. Columbia was this magnet because the bridge crossing the river was the focal point. It was one of the main passageways coming this way from that area to Philadelphia. So these three guys invented this system that we have contrived in, in this artistic uh, version of how they created the system of installing a false end inside of their lumber boxcars and spiriting people in there and getting them to Philadelphia in eight hours. This is the only place I know of where the actual railroad was used as part of what became known as the Underground Railroad. In, in the lexicon of the abolitionist press, late 1830s, early 1840s, and beyond. That's the first time you can see this word in print. So just recently, we installed this historical marker, we being the African American Historical Society, to commemorate these guys on the train line that extends from Lemon Street up the Harrisburg Pike, that last Janet's called Janet Stork Corridor Park. It's the last piece of the right-of-way of the old Philadelphia and Columbia Railroad. So we now have this marker out there. And also, if you've ever you've been on, some of you guys have been on our tours, yes. um, you go to the train station, we're at the site of the old train station at the parking garage of Queen and Chestnut. Inside there's a display, a history display of Lancaster history. In the back end of it, we were able, by virtue of the, some of the proceeds from our tours, we um, 
uh, are installing and designing and installing these historical markers, and this story is told in there for the first time as well. So we're pulling this information from the deep recesses of books and histories and bringing it into, into people on the street, basically. So I will stop there. But one thing um, I'd like to just end with about these attitudes, and we'll take some questions. Um, and this is, this is in the records that we set around here. I just found it very interesting that Jasper Yates, one of the, one of the luminaries of the early uh, St. James, his boy, his black boy, was named Voltaire, the, the philosopher of the Enlightenment. So, we shall stop. I have more to, sh more to tell and show, but we, we should probably stop and take some questions. Is there anything I can share with you or go back to or? I missed it. Way in the back, Jean. I, would, I was interested somewhere along the line you said about indigenous service being not only black, but I read and done some family research and then in Germany yes. they came over to our indigenous service. Mm -hmm. Correct. Absolutely. Uh, in fact, there were three German-speaking churches in the city I just found out about yesterday. I knew of two, but I heard the third one was really, really um, remarkable. This would have meant that a lot of African Americans then would have been bilingual. You know, they would have had to, if they wanted to follow the services, they would have had to pick up the language, which would have been interesting. And by the way, Leroy Hopkins is Afro-German. He studied Afro-German history in, in uh, Europe, and he was there uh, in Germany during, uh, I guess, the 60s, and has found out that many members of his family have uh, German roots, German background. Yes? I missed Heidi? the beginning of your talk, but I would just say, I did the African American walking tour a month or so ago. Uh-huh. Thumbs up. Good. I recommend it to everyone. Check Thank it you. out when the weather warms up. Yeah, yeah. Right. Thank there you very were, much. There were things that I had no idea, and oh, that I wanted I, to then do more research on. You know, that is the most rewarding thing. Anytime I do a presentation or a tour, when that, when that pops, when that word or that sentence comes out, you know, I never, I never read about this stuff. I would never heard that since you. I mean, it's just, and what we realized when we decided four years ago to put these walking tours together, uh, again, Leroy Hopkins is the kind of guiding force, because he's written basically everything there is about African American history in the Journal of the Lancaster County Historical Society. He has about 12 very well done, highly researched articles there. Uh, he'll be speak he's speaking around a lot these days in Columbia on November 12th, I think he is, at the, the city with the crossings there. Um, that's his next uh, presentation. But the point is, we, we all started putting our heads together, pulling these pictures together, and, and trying to put this into a guidebook. So we were able to train. The Unitarian Church, by the way, gave us a grant, uh, $10,000, $11,000 uh, a year ago, to allow us to install the two latest markers that are out there on the streets and also to train 20 people who, were, who volunteered to come forward and we trained them and gave them a stipend in exchange for them committing to, to helping with our tours that Heidi just referenced uh, over this season. So we just finished the last of the tours yesterday and we're starting to start up in the spring. But just so you know, we, I will do these presentations on demand and other members of our society will do tours on demand anytime because we want to get this information out there to schools, to church groups, to, to anybody. Um, that we can. So, but uh, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Yes, sir. Uh, several years ago, Leroy Hopkins was here and uh, talked here in the forum, and he said that the two major black, well, Columbia and Conestoga, were majority black towns. Yes. And that also was the fact, you know, during the Civil War and before. Uh, also, he took. Oh, wait, can I just stop there? They, yeah. they had sizable uh, pop, uh, populations of African Americans, but they weren't majority. Well, it didn't uh, become majority. He, told, he said that. I don't know. And he took German with me at McCaskey High School. Did he? So, yeah, he's okay. very smart. <laughs> yes. Yeah, he, he was one of the first African Americans to get a, get a PhD from Harvard in German or in the language. Yes, indeed. So, anything else? Anybody? Yes, sir. So Thomas Bell purchased Stephen Smith. Did he then have an epiphany later on about letting him go? Yeah. Did he, he purchased him with the intention to have him as a slave? Well, because he was Stephen Smith was born, let's say, in 1790s, late 1790s, would have been after the Gradual Abolition Act. He was living in a family of an, of an enslaved woman in Harrisburg. Uh, so he would have been under that servitude for 27 years of his first 27 years of his life unless he found a way to buy his freedom or someone paid for the freedom or the owner 
uh, granted his freedom called manumission. We don't know. That's the, the, the short answer is we just don't know. And we would, I would love to know because that's what I'm postulating here. What if, what if Bao, a Christian in our community, our church community, think? And when did he have such an epiphany? Was it here? Was it when he got to Columbia? He was a U.S. congressman for one, one for the whole county for one term. He was a Federalist that Thomas Jefferson branded follower. Um, not that he was a pure as a drug, so, but, you know. Um, yes, Lisa. Um, do you know anything about these early folks who stood up against slavery that were, that were big in their communities? Did they have backlash? Was there anything mm. done to them? Was there anything done to anybody who stood up against slavery in their own communities? Well, um, I have, let's see. I, I do believe I have some stories, I have some names of people here that we should talk about. These guys, lay leadership at St. James. Sorry I didn't get to them because we're running out of time. These guys joined the uh, Abolition Society. Um, and those guys, oh, sorry, I'm going back. Back, back, back. Um, these guys uh, were members of the lay leadership, joined the Abolition Society uh, in Philadelphia. I'm sorry, lost it. Um, the other gentleman that I flashed up there, I'm sorry, um, signed a resolution at the courthouse. They were members of St. James. I'm not sure who else was there. That was common at the time. You would, you would have a public meeting and, and, and appoint an officer and a court a secretary, and you would arrive at some kind of a political, social position, write it up, and get it published somehow, or send it to somebody of note. That was how information and the standing of a particular community was, was established back then. So was there backlash? I don't know. It's hard to say. So one thing I wanted to point out while, while we're on this, <coughs> two seconds here. Um, this, we know that St. James, all of the churches, the, the African Americans left the churches around 1820, about the same time we were building our church. And they eventually formed what became Bethel AME. And Bethel, that, that church community was known as St. James African Church. From 1820 up until the city direct, the earliest city directory we have is the early 40s, and it's still listed as St. James African Church. And Bethel, the name Bethel was taken in the late uh, 1870 or 80, something like that. But uh, some of the, the, the most well off, uh, in, uh, you say, you say entrepreneurial kind of focused people, black men from this community, heads of household, were the founders of Bethel Amy. Uh, and they came from First Reform, they came from First Presbyterian and Trinity to form that faith community about that 1820, same time we were building the, the church here. So I guess we're, we can we can keep going, we have 10 minutes, we can keep talking. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, I was always taught that people, indentured people, agree to their indentureship in order to pay off passage from Europe to yeah. America. Right. right. My question then is, so they were enslaved actually? No. But, but their conditions were how much yeah, different where they were. Right. But they had the opportunity, they will be free after a certain time. I was going to ask you, after they completed their indenture to, for lack of a yeah. better word, yeah. was the honorable thing done? Were they then free to do whatever? Whatever they wanted to do, yes. And we assume that they you know, developed some skills, developed some, put some money aside, and were able to move on independently. But everybody would have been there. It would have been, you know, they were, who knows, a variety of things. They were given a, a certain stipend on the end of their indenture. Like with a small amount of money, that's uh -huh. part of the obligation. I think it then go off. Go off. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So you would pay. You would indenture yourself to the shipping company or some sponsor. And and I'm reading that when you would get to Philadelphia or some port here, that person had to be there. And there was all kinds of varieties of things that happened, positive and negative, when you were trying to actually get off the ship to get to there. So, yes. I'm just wondering why was it necessary to form after? Uh, is it because of a, a comfort level of not being integrated, wanting to be separated? Uh, well, it was segregated seating. It was it was segregated seating in in the 1780s in Philadelphia, St. George's uh, Methodist Church. But I mean, same thing. Well, the same thing happened. Um, that that happened. They, the folks in, the, in Philadelphia were not allowed to sit in the service on Sunday morning where they wanted to. So that's why they formed their own church. They formed their own church. They protested in Philadelphia, and that set the tone and the sentiment that black people should be allowed to worship God like mm -hmm. everybody else does. And then that sentiment took root here. St. James and all the other churches, 
They all had segregated seating. Um, Trinity had made people, black people sit in the balcony when there was a, well, there is still a balcony there. We had a balcony too, and I think we had uh, seating for black people there. Do you think we'll ever become integrated? <laughs> would that be, uh, would that be, would that be good? Yes, it would. Yeah, right, right. And why? Why, why is that? Well, as Martin Luther King says, Sunday morning is the most segregated place in America. And, that, the, and this is the reason, the roots of the reason. Yes, ma'am. What's the involvement in the abolitionist movement pretty much generalized across the board with denominations, or were there certain denominations that were more active and certain ones that maybe put off that type of um, well, um, the, uh, there's a gentleman named a professor from Dickinson College named Matt Pinsker, who's from Franklin Marshall, and he's heading up this, this, this entity within Dickinson College under the history department called the House Divided. He's, he, like uh, Dr. Marlene Arnold, is engaging students to plumb the depths of that kind of information. You know, what were the attitudes of the people? And their take in there was that Dickinson in Cumberland County, um, Carlisle, they had people from both sides of the equation around the Civil War. They had some southern, young Southern men there. They had northern uh, people from the northern free call communities. And they're looking at what, how, who were, where did they come from? Their faith community. What did they believe? Mm -hmm. No, it wasn't. There was some, what he would, uh, what uh, Pinsker says is that all Quakers were not abolitionists and Underground Railroad operators, but most Underground Railroad operators and abolitionists were Quakers in this area. Right, but there's been some revisionist history that saying that the Quakers were not all that they were built up to be. There were slave-owning Quakers in Philadelphia in the early years. And later, again, Epiphany comes along. There was their progressive wing of the Quakers, and then there was the more conservative wing of the Quakers. So that was a schism in that. And uh, Methodists were involved, it seems. And I think a lot of it comes from the itinerant ministers, that from the AME church and the Methodist church, they seem to have spread the word that created the grapevine that allowed people to consider that there were other places beyond slave beyond the slave holding areas that you could move to and find freedom, and that gave license to the movement that we consider. And I've been telling folks that the Underground Railroad is a civil rights movement about movement, a movement of people from one place to another, leaving a bad situation to come to a totally a better situation. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, go ahead. Um, Randy, many years ago, uh, when I came to this church, they were doing history, and part of some of the discussion was about the founding of the church, how it was founded. And there was supposedly a Jewish woman who was very instrumental in founding of St. James. I don't know if she, it was, I, I don't know all the details of that, but I think she ran some of the, 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 the church school here for a while. And I may provide some of the funding to get it started. I don't. Um, I just saw something like that Cordelia's leaving, maybe she knows. Uh, I know? know nothing about the beginning. There, were, there was a, a teacher, not at the beginning, more 19th century, who was Jewish by origin, who was involved with the church. But I don't know anything about the 1700s. 1700s, sort of. Okay. Well, there was some discussion about that, but I don't remember all the details. But it wasn't mentioned at all. In this 275th anniversary. Oh, well, there's only so much palette that you can yeah. work with to, to put up there. So many stories, so many people. So we've, we've really got to, got to move on. I'll stay here and answer questions if you like. If you want to.